thank you maharaj for joining today for this monks podcast it's very great to have you here yes so i thought today we could discuss about uh, the subject of sensitivity in presenting spiritual wisdom in today's culture quite often offensive words are equated with violence in fact they considered more serious than violence and especially in the west people the word uses they're cancelled because they made some politically incorrect comments or some of comments that are considered offensive so i've seen two different attitudes one is the word is at one level think that because people will get offended let us not speak anything which will offend them and other is that you know we have to speak what we have to speak and whether people get offended or not that is their problem so how do we have a balance between the two maybe that maybe we could discuss something based about that yeah i think really it's a question of uh, judgment it's a question of wisdom it's also a question of one's own nature you know uh, wisdom in terms of determining what is the best way to speak at a particular time in a particular place for a certain set of people mm. and in circumstances you know yes and then also there is the nature of the person you know that's a good perspective uh-huh. yeah but some people will just be what they are yes some people are naturally very outspoken and they as they say they say it like it is yeah <laughs> some are generally not like that so you know Uh, different strokes for different folks so different people will have different approaches so i think that uh, cannot be negated it's always going to be there so i guess wisdom is what you know incorporates uh, the judgment and takes into account the understanding of of uh, how to say it where to say it when to say it what to say yes maj i think prabhupad defines in the 10th chapter of the bhagavad gita intelligence means to see things in their proper perspective so yeah you know that that is also something similar or desh kal patra as we have discussed earlier also so now i think uh, most of our talk will focus on intelligence now with respect to nature uh there is uh, at one level if somebody is known to speak maybe a little brusk known to speak in a particular way and then people get used to that so and some people feel that you know, we are just so the problem is i wouldn't say so much that if somebody has a particular nature but when they start thinking this is the right thing to do for everyone that is when the problem comes up that means what i am speaking is the right way to speak and everybody else is is not courageous enough to speak the way i speak then it may happen that others may get a either start doubting whether this is the way i am meant to speak or may artificially start imitating and generally if if we are with a person for some time then we just get to know their nature and then we know which words are spoken with real anger or which is spoken just because of nature so there is a adequate need to acknowledge nature but then to consider one's nature to be a virtue that is where it becomes a problem i feel it also depends on other factors you know like what kind of relationship you have with the person you speak to you know if if you have a very old relationship with the person the understanding is good the other person knows you very well understands you for what you are then you can speak so many things and the person will not take offense or will not misunderstand on the other hand if you just met someone for the first time and you say something 
then that person may take offense because there is no relationship there. So that's another factor, the relationship. Okay. Another factor could be, let's say, age. You know, an elderly person can get away with saying certain things or small children can get away by saying certain things. A, but people in between may not be able to get away so easily. So <laughs> That's a good way, yes. What Prabhupada would say, mm. you know, others may not be able to say and get away with it. Okay. Another I factor would be okay. the level of one's spiritual advancement. The more advanced one is, maybe it will be accepted. And maybe for others it won't, you know. And also, you know, it, it depends because just as the speakers have different natures, the listeners also have different natures. Now, I know, uh, I'm sure we all know, uh, different devotees or different individuals, even if they're not devotees, uh, who have different ways of presenting their opinions. Some are very brusque, very blunt, to the point of being harsh, sometimes, you know, being offensive even. And they have their takers. I mean, there are people who really uh, like that. Some people like to hear such speakers. And there are others who may get completely turned away from such speakers and then I prefer others who are probably softer and you know, like that. So it really depends. I remember one time there was a devotee I and mean, he's still there, of course. And he was well known for being very brash in his speaking. And sometimes uh, sitting in the class, I would cringe a little bit. Oh, oh, he's speaking in a certain way like this and you know. And several others would be like me, who would cringe sometimes a little bit. Mm. But there were some others who really relished it. And they, <laughs> they found it, oh, you know, very nice. And, and, and they got attracted to Krishna consciousness. They, they, you know, became good devotees. Some others maybe got turned away because of that. So it's a very... Uh, kind of subjective thing, you know. But yes, uh, okay. as you said, it's, we, we have to keep in mind different strokes for different folks. Uh, and different speakers will have their own natures and it's not possible to expect that everybody will uh, speak exactly in the same way. <clears throat> uh, so we have to accommodate that. <clears throat> yes, Maharaj. And just echoing your point, I remember one devotee had invited me to, he was doing village preaching and he invited me to his village for speaking. And then I, I have a normally a very analytical way of presenting and people were okay, they passively hearing. But then after I finished, he spoke a few minutes and he was like making fun of how foolish this thing is. And we should do this, we should not do that. And I saw people were enjoying that. So I realized that they didn't need an analytical kind of presentation. They needed a more something which stirs things up. So, so I would say that now that maybe I was just trying to think of a visual. There are four factors that the speaker, there is the, there is the content of the speech. Then there's the context of the speech and then there's the hearer. So I, the context and the hearer can be the same, but they can be different also. Like somebody might want to hear, <clears throat> might, not, might be okay hearing some harsh words about oneself being spoken in private, but not in public. So if you consider these four things, speaker, content, context, and audience, or hearer, then on one side, from our perspective, if we are speakers, we can try to sensitize ourselves to the context and the audience. But another side, as you rightly said, that different people have different natures. So then maybe it is the hearer's responsibility to find out who are the speakers they can connect with, who they can be inspired by. And then, so it's a more of a two-way responsibility instead of <laughs> at one level saying that the speakers have to 
moderate the way they speak but we can also say the hearers need to moderate who they hear from yeah that is there you know in a situation where we have bhagavatam classes in the temple let's say and the devotees attend and, the the and yeah. there are different speakers almost every day yes so the hearer may be able to relate to some speakers and may be able to not relate to some other speakers but so long as the speaker is speaking uh information or knowledge or presenting things from the scripture in an authorized way he is not concocting something he is not creating a new philosophy he is not misrepresenting it or he is not really uh, you know causing some major offense or something something like that uh mm-hmm. i think one should hear and keeping in mind that there are different styles of presentation and ultimately because it is the the, the spirit the uh, spiritual wisdom which is authentic one should hear <clears throat> yes much the problem comes up when there's when the listener feels that the speaker is not speaking something that is authorized that the speaker is deviating from the philosophy or something like that that is when the yeah. little issue will come up <clears throat> yes and there will be different you know understandings of that also yeah so just so there is at one level if somebody is a as you mentioned the context somebody is regularly coming for classes then even if somebody gets disturbed by hearing something they have yeah. some they ha- they have the regular connections with devotees where they can seek clarification and then they can get things resolved now the problem especially in today's world is that most of the content is available online and online at one level we don't know who all are hearing and especially if something is preserved online so something which uh, say in a close environment could seem just like a good joke can in a different setting seem like a horrible insult so so the in one sense the context has changed significantly today and it's almost like every word is we have to weigh it to consider how different people will perceive it and that makes things much tough, tougher so yes this is these are the perils of uh speaking via the internet yeah we expand the reach but we expand the danger also yeah so one has to speak in a measured way but of course if one is speaking with sensitivity with uh, one is speaking the truth but properly sensitively then i think that's not really such a problem it's not that such things happen so frequently they, they may happen sometimes but if we are careful about how we present things in any case one should be careful whether it's on the internet or not if one is speaking on a public platform then one should be careful anyway hmm one should see that uh, one is presenting things in the right manner one is speaking the right philosophy one is you know being sensitive to certain concerns yes manaj Mm-hmm. so um, so there is it was going back to these four points of the speaker the content the context and the hearer so to some extent you know, there is a purpose for speaking at one level we could say the purpose is simply to glorify krishna and whoever hears the glorification of krishna does become purified by that mm-hmm. at the same time we have to see for a particular audience whether they are being attracted toward krishna or not or are they getting alienated toward krishna at a subconscious level somebody might be purified by hearing about krishna mm-hmm. but at a conscious level they might get alienated so if we consider say bhakti sanskrit thakur would rate articles based on how many times the word krishna would come 
and then he would publish them in the harmonist now one of the early books that shri prabhupad wrote was ishopanishad and in the ishopanishad prabhupad doesn't use the word krishna much at all he uses the word god or uh, the supreme and krishna is used very sparsely and one understanding i got is that ishopanishad was meant more for people coming from impersonal background so prabhupada doesn't use the personal address too much over there so we see here prabhupada also is prabhupada is not compromising on the message he does point out the deficiencies with of the impersonal understanding when it is considered the ultimate understanding within the content of what he is speaking but he is regulating uh, the words that he uses similarly when prabhupada uh, is presenting uh, in easy journey to other planets he is very respectful to scientists he says our we present this for the consideration of our esteemed readers the scientists and then he uses the word antimatter to refer to spirit so so i was making this point that as a speaker how important is it for us to consider the what is the effect of what i am speaking can i just say that this is what has been spoken and this is what i am going to speak but what is the effect of that how much should that uh, determine what i speak i think because your question was why are, why are we speaking the truth right yes so i mean it is a given that we have to speak the truth yes we cannot speak the wrong philosophy we cannot speak yeah we cannot misrepresent but what is the purpose of doing that so very succinctly if one were to to uh, explain the purpose of speaking satyam it is hitam which is for the benefit and welfare of everyone okay that's the sum and substance of of any form of communication you know whether it's verbal communication written communication or uh, communication through gestures or whatever the purpose ultimately should always be hitam which means for the benefit of everybody you know this is one of my uh, favorite verses favorite in the sense that i quote it often because it is of great practical value you know from the 7th chapter of the a 17th chapter of the bhagavad gita when krishna speaks about austerity of speech yes. body and mind and in austerity of speech he says anudvega karam vakyam satyam priyahitam chayat adhyaya bhyasam chayat anmayam tato uthe so he speaks uh, he gives different characteristics of of our speech and one is that uh, the the vakyam or our sentences or our speech should not be udvega karam <clears throat> udvega means to cause agitation or disturbance it mm. should be anudvega karam so the first quality of speech in the mode of goodness is that it doesn't agitate others unnecessarily yes and the second is satyam which is the truth third is priya which is it should be pleasing fourth is hitam which means is beneficial and the fifth is swadhyaya abhyasanam so one should recite you know the vedic literature the holy name so van mayam tapa uchyate so this is austerity of the voice or austerity of speech mm. so of all these categories you know or these elements that are mentioned here obviously it is important to speak satyam because we can't speak uh, a false word by satyam in various uh, conversations and letters shri prabhupad um refers to satyam as being spiritual wisdom yes so when you especially when you're discussing scripture or spiritual knowledge then satyam is very important hmm at the same time what is the purpose of that satyam it is hitam 
as mentioned in, in this verse of the Bhagavad Gita. So, I mean, there is, uh, there is much that Prabhupada has said on this, uh, about it. And I think as we go along, perhaps we'll get an opportunity to discuss it also. But to succinctly answer your question as to what is the purpose of speaking anything, it should be hitam. Okay. Benefit. But what is benefit? That has to be seen in the light of satyam, of truth. Because if one doesn't have knowledge of the truth, then one may have some misconception about what hitam or benefit is. You know, and say for, for example, one may continue to give uh, some intoxicating substances to an addict just because one feels that that is for his or her benefit because otherwise the person is suffering, so let me give it. So I would say the ultimate purpose should always be hitam. That has to be kept in mind. But hitam with reference to satyam. <coughs> and here, here it's a little nuanced because um, what exactly is the effect that we are looking for? We want to do good to somebody. We are speaking the truth. Our motivation is good. We want to do good to somebody. But the result is contrary to what we hope for. So then it means we have to uh, re-navigate, we have to rethink, where did I go wrong? Yes. Now, there will always be people who will get upset whatever you say. So you can't stop speaking the truth because somebody doesn't like it. But the point is that as far as possible, uh, we have to keep in mind the effect it's going to have. <coughs> So there's satyam, there is hitam, the benefit, mm -hmm. and at the same time, there is also the reaction, the response um, of that speech or that action on somebody else. Ultimately, we want that person to respond positively. Yes, Maharaj. So... If we consider Anudvega Karam and uh, Priyam, so uh, of course at one level, this is all from the speaker's perspective. Now, I intend to speak in a way that doesn't agitate. I intend to speak in a way that is, that is truthful, that is beneficial, that is pleasing. So we could, if, if we say have a, uh, like a four quadrant visual, now one is, we speak that is, if we just put these two things, beneficial and pleasing. Yeah, beneficial and pleasing. So the top right hand corner quadrant is beneficial and pleasing. This is what is most desirable. Most desirable. Mm -hmm. Then we have, say, beneficial but not pleasing in the green one. Beneficial and not dis beneficial and displeasing. Beneficial, you could say it is maybe es maybe essential at times. Yeah. Um, but it may it's not desirable, but maybe essential. Yeah. Then if it is not beneficial, not pleasing, that is definitely yeah. undesirable. Yeah. Never to be done. Okay. Not just undesirable, but never to be done. So. And then if something is pleasing but not beneficial, then we could also, say this is also this not is, to be done. Okay, not, not to be done. This is underutilization. We are not really doing any benefit to them. Yeah. So unless there's benefit, we should not do it. <laughs> okay. So if we look at this now, in this context, if someone considers that so if, if you take the standard doctor metaphor doctor patient metaphor that the doctor has to give medication sometimes the medication may be painful maybe the medicine may be better or the injection has to be given which is painful 
so where it is essential it it may have to be done but where it is possible the doctor should do it in a way that is as painless as possible yes and the doctor should never do anything that is not beneficial for the patient yeah so if the doctor just inject something which is not a medicine at all yeah then that is undesirable yeah so, so the two quadrants which which are not to be done never to be done that's not beneficial so therefore we should never do it interesting you, you can put here there is placebo effect where <laughs> it is actually not meant to be beneficial but it's pleasing oh i am getting treated but in a sense but, people get benefited yes so therefore that there is some benefit there a placebo has its benefits too yeah you know so, the worst you know the worst that comes to mind with this uh, uh diagram yeah this is uh, a verse prabhupad used to quote and there was a lot of discussion on this <coughs> satyam bruyat priyam bruyat correct correct satyam bruyat priyam bruyat maam bruyat satyam apriyam priyam cha nan ritam bruyat esh dharma sanatana so satyam bruyat bruyat means speak speak the truth but priyam bruyat speak it pleasingly so satyam bruyat priyam bruyat <coughs> speak the truth speak it pleasingly so that's number 4 yeah right yes ma then ma bruyat satyam apriyam don't speak satyam. truth that is not pleasing so that is quadrant 2 quadrant 2 here it says don't do it yeah but prabhu pat did say at times that this is a social convention and uh, when when it comes to scriptural discussions or spiritual wisdom uh, because we are spreading the message of uh, krishna consciousness you know we are not obliged to always abide by this dictum by this social convention we may have to speak the truth sometimes even if it is you know not pleasing Uh, yes. but also there are i mean this will need a little discussion perhaps as we go along but bruyat ma bruyat satyam apriyam essentially it says don't speak truth that is apriyam which is not pleasing so it essentially says don't be in number 2 yes but okay. prabhu pal says it may be essential we have to do it <laughs> yes that's true therefore in number 2 we are speaking of uh being uh abiding by satyam even if it is not pleasing yes maharaj right mm. then priyam cha na anritam bruyat so don't speak something that is anritam which means false which is not true merely because it is pleasing yes right so uh that is probably number 3 and i think yes. the number 1 doesn't deserve mention itself the yes. it, is, it is implicit it should not be done yes so number 3 means it is very pleasing but it's not truthful it's not beneficial hmm because if something is not truthful it won't be beneficial either yeah right so uh, number 3 uh, is actually uh, that something you say something that is pleasing but it is not truthful it is not beneficial so we should not do it that's what it means priyam cha nandritam bruyat esha dharma sanatana and number 1 means it's neither pleasing nor truthful nor beneficial we should never indulge in that right yes maharaj so so we look number 4 you know uh, there is a uh, you know uh, you have these subhashitas proverbs in sanskrit yes maharaj and there is a, a proverb called apriyasya chapathyasya 
sometimes even though something is a priya it should still be spoken if it is patya if it is hitam yes it is even if something is disagreeable uh it should be spoken if it is wholesome if it is beneficial if it is truthful so we see vidura speaking to dhritarashtra about this in the mahabharat or we see maricha speaking to ravana about this in the ramayan so mm. ravan goes to him and says you know you should help me to kill ram uh, or you should help me to abduct sita uh, yes and distracting uh, ram and getting him to the forest and maricha cautions him that you know you're inviting death don't do this i mean you'll find many people who will tell you what's pleasing to you but a true friend is one who will tell you the truth and as your genuine well wisher i'm telling you don't do this yes man and, and he, in fact he, he, in fact he says that whoever has advised you to do this is actually your enemy and should be punished enemy. yes yeah. yes yes man as going so back to the trashta's example sorry do you know the trashta's example yes. sorry just, just going back to the trashta's example there's one point over there that vidura and dhritarashtra had a lifelong relationship and if you yes. read the mahabharat vidura does not speak in that tone with that severity any time earlier yes he does he does uh, speak his disapproval quite vocally whenever duryodhana is doing something wrong and he, so he doesn't hide his disapproval but the tone which he uses in the bhagavatam that we don't see in the mahabharat so in one sense vidura we can also say that although vidura speaks strongly to dhritarashtra he also speaks strongly at the right time in yes. by maybe while dhritarashtra had duryodhana and he was still that attachment was still a hopeful attachment then he was blind to anything else so i feel a strong speech there are examples of strong speech but there is also like earlier you said the age of a person even strong speech is effective at particular times so it may not be effective at other times yes so, you know there is there is it means there is one thing that in principle we do acknowledge the category 2 as valid that there are times when even if something is displeasing it needs to be spoken but what are those times that has to be carefully discerned and so maybe we could discuss some criteria based on which when uh, when when is speaking in quadrant 2 acceptable or it is essential we could say so th- th- there are examples in principle we accept that but in practice when to do that could there be any guidelines for that when it is essential to speak the truth even if it is not pleasing meaning a priya sya cha patya sya yes right so your question is uh, what are those circumstances yes when it is essential to speak the truth even though it is displeasing yes right hmm. i would say when the third quadrant that is speaking the truth pleasingly is not possible or is not effective or uh, somehow is not possible to do or is not appropriate or we could say is not effective also uh, it's not workable it's not effective the first priority should always be uh, satyam bruyat priyam bruyat okay. speak it knowledgeably speak it truthfully that quadrant speak the truth but speak it and it should be for the benefit and it should also be pleasing 
that should always be the first priority. Right? Okay. Uh, you know, when it comes to uh, Srila Prabhupada's criticism of Satyam Bruyat Priyam Bruyat, uh, Ma Bruyat Satyam Priyam, that, you know, don't speak truth that is displeasing. So Prabhupada, as I mentioned earlier, said this is a social convention and all that. So many times in his lectures, in his letters, conversations, Prabhupada will uh, mention that no, this social convention is not applicable to us as devotees and that we should be willing to speak the truth because that is the important thing. Uh, now, there are also many occasions when Srila Prabhupada tempered that very strong stand. Yes. That he took. Yes, Maharaj. I mean, I mean, don't look at the other course, then you may, you may think that you should always, regardless of the point, is if one looks at Srila Prabhupada's course, then Srila Prabhupada was not against speaking truth in a palatable way at all. It's not that because he said that we should speak the truth regardless of whether it is pleasing or displeasing. It doesn't mean that he was against speaking the truth in a palatable way. What I'm trying to say is mm. that it is not that speaking truth is necessarily synonymous with being unpleasant. Yes. It's not that every time you speak the truth, it must be unpleasant. That's true. You know, it's, it's not like that. Sometimes it may be so. And that's where the second quadrant, where we have to speak the truth despite the fact that, you know, it's displeasing to somebody. Yes. Right? Yes, but, so th there are many instances like this in which Prabhupada uh, did mention one letter that he wrote to one devotee in which he cautioned him to speak the truth but deal with him softly because he has spiritual inclination. So that devotee may have been, you know, speaking to some other person. Hmm. And uh, so in that connection, the devotee must have written to Srila Prabhupada. So then Srila Prabhupada responded that you must speak the truth, yes, but deal with him softly because he has a spiritual inclination. <clears throat> so meaning, if you see that spiritual inclination in somebody, you know, then you would be careful. Deal softly. So basically the idea is the spiritual inclination needs to be fanned. And that yeah. shouldn't be, that yeah. shouldn't get extinguished. Yes, yes. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, and because of, of harsh speech, because of truth being spoken harshly, even when it, it was not really necessary, when it could have been avoided, what may you may end up doing is to drive that person away. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, a negative impression about you know spiritual knowledge, about Krishna consciousness, you know, like that. <clears throat> yeah. So the effort should always be to speak the truth palatably. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. So that is first criteria we could say. Now, yes, uh, now, <coughs> sometimes, now with respect to when the truth is, truth is unpalatable or displeasing. Now, why is it displeasing? There could be various reasons for that. One is, you know, sometimes people say that I will not pander to political correctness. <coughs> but it is not that uh, every time sensitivity is asked for, that doesn't mean we are pandering to political correctness. Or we could put it this way that some norms of political correctness have evolved because of a valid need for sensitivity. But sometimes some norms of political correctness become so extreme that they don't just don't allow the truth to be spoken. So then we can see that if the truth is displeasing, why is it displeasing? It could be because maybe the person is hypersensitive and they need to be, you know, we, we, if, if, we just, <clears throat> if we just dance around the truth, as they say, 
then we will not benefit them at all but sometimes it could be that also uh, so one so we could say why is it displeasing we can consider that and then yes if it is something specific to a particular context then adjusting things so that it is not displeasing to that person say for example uh, there are certain words which were quite common place in the past say for example the n word was quite common place maybe 50 or 100 years ago to refer to a particular class of people <coughs> now it is considered <coughs> outrageous so there are many words <coughs> which just set off uh, unnecessary agitation in people's minds say for example the word cult prabhupad often says the word the cult of krishna consciousness or the cult of lord chaitanya mahaprabhu but today the word cult just triggers a lot of uh, agitation or oh, there's a indoctrination there is uh, manipulation of people and it, all it uh, triggers alarm so when we talk about agitation <coughs> so what is causing that agitation and whether that agitation is essential or not sometimes we might say this is the way it was spoken this is the word that we use i am using them now but it's causing agitation which is this is not necessary so then we changing certain words so that that agitation is not caused that is not changing the truth because that's something which is just you might say the same truth, but it is having a undesirable effect so we could look at why it is causing agitation and then mm. see whether the we need to still speak that or not speak that mm. thoughts on this maharaj you know we we started off our uh, <clears throat> discussion by speaking about and not just the circumstances but and the listeners but also the speakers right yes so it is the speaker's responsibility to make a good judgment you know if we keep in mind that the purpose of speaking of satyam is hitam then we will have to keep in mind sensitivities you know and also in a said natures of people are different some people uh, like to be told things strongly you just do it and some people uh, you know will will go away if you tell them something like that just do this you know they will go away some people just tell you just tell me what to do <laughs> hmm. so it's really a very subjective thing and each one will will act differently um but if we keep in mind that you know as prabhupad says in in one of the purports in um, bhagavad gita he says the purpose of speaking satyam is to present facts as they are to to not misrepresent and also it should be for the benefit of others is this in the bhagavad gita or the bhagavatam maharaj that prabhupad talks about realization bhagavad gita purports okay so one of the bhagavad gita purports where he speaks about um uh, uh, satyam yeah satyam so satyam means to present the facts properly don't misrepresent the facts and ultimately it should be done for the benefit of everybody concerned mm-hmm. so the speaker has to keep that in mind now because these things are so fluid and so uh, subject to uh, the perceptions of the speaker so there will be different ways in which different speakers judge a certain person or judge a certain situation and both speakers will will speak differently because their judgment of the situation differs and also their personal natures differ hmm so you know we we can't uh, paint all speakers with one brush there is going to be a difference 
But I think we can keep in mind these three main points that Prabhupada said about uh, uh, the yes. purpose of speaking to them. Yes, Maharaj, that's true. Now, just uh, taking this a little further, now, Satya and Hita, they are not necessarily equivalent. Although normally Satya will lead to Hita, but here we have the point of like, if you administer a medicine, the person is benefited. But in the case of spiritual growth, it is that the person has to consciously choose to turn toward Krishna. So uh, how, <coughs> how, how can we quantify what is Hita? It is that a person heard the pure undiluted message of Krishna. Is that the benefit? Or is it that the person heard something and became attracted and then wants to hear more? Or is it that the person heard something, but then that was so, so agitating to that person that they left. So Hita, we could see it as get them to hear once or get them to hear so that they can keep hearing more and more. So, so that could also means talk about, you know, gradation. Uh, so Satya can be spoken at levels according to uh, maybe so right now this person can digest only this much and then maybe a little more they can digest. So hit, hit, how would we uh, quantify Hita over here? Can we say that increased eagerness to hear about Krishna is the Hita or uh, how, what would be by Hita over here? Benefit? I would say Hita has to be seen in the context of uh, to what degree the listener is, is getting closer <clears throat> to the spiritual path and to Krishna consciousness in a sustainable way. You know, so we, we also take a longer term thing. Let's say you speak the truth so that person has heard this spiritual wisdom. So it's, it's gone in. But because of the way that person was dealt with, because of the way uh, that knowledge was spoken, this person may be turned away <clears throat> and may not come back. Okay? Mm. So the truth has gone inside, but it's not been digested. But you've lost the person at least for this life or at least for a long time. Yes. But if it is spoken in a certain way that ensures that the person is not driven away, yes. that you know, he comes back and he listens to more and he then discusses with you and so on, then obviously that's, that's a better way of doing things. <coughs> so I would say that would be the criterion. It's very hard to quantify such a thing. But yeah, of course not criterion. What degree a, are you bringing that person closer to Krishna? So, so that Hita has to be that, as you said, that the person is going away, then we have not really done Hita. So, yes. so continuing the medicine metaphor, you know, that suppose somebody does some procedure which is excessively painful, that the patient will say, I'll not come again at all. Or if we could say more of a, like a physical therapy, uh, that uh, you get the patient to do some exercises. Now, if you don't get the patient out of the comfort zone, then they will nearly not improve. They will not recover. But if you exercise the patient so much that they think, hey, this is the workout I have to do every day. I cannot do it. They just stop coming after me. So that means that if we could talk these, about these three things, you know, that comfort zone, stretch zone, and panic zone. So a certain amount of agitation may be required we have to challenge people's existing conceptions to some extent. But if it is such a big challenge that they feel their whole world is falling apart, then they may mm. think it's not worth it. The price or think that what you're saying is so dead against their cherished beliefs, yes. which they hold very dear to them and they just can't bear uh, the thought of you know, even listening further to such a thing, then perhaps that person is not a good candidate to be spoken to in any case. But perhaps in some cases, these entrenched beliefs uh, 
maybe because of not having had the opportunity here yes krishna consciousness being presented in the proper way so that's really a judgment that the speaker has to make you know mm-hmm. it's all very subjective and that's why i use the word wisdom and we also had judgment we had nature you know wow. these are the, these are the uh, uh, factors that will uh, ultimately determine how a speaker presents things <clears throat> yes maharaj so another point to just i mean this is as you said it's nuanced and subtle another point to complicate things is that the people don't necessarily in advance accept the truth to be the truth in today's world there are so many spiritual paths and they when they come to a spiritual teacher to hear there may be some acceptance okay this person may be wise and i am ready to give them a hearing but we may think i am speaking authorized truth based on shastra but we cannot assume that our audience accepts our authority yes so, so to some extent uh you know people may judge us or evaluate or assess us based not so much simply on what we speak but also how we speak it how we conduct ourselves so it might be that uh, in a one hour class 50 59 minutes might be sound reasoned arguments but one minute might be some harsh words spoken and then that's what that person remembers <laughs> <laughs> so you know one time there was a uh, some devotee wrote a letter to shri prabhupada and i asked the question that uh should one always speak the truth okay he was referring to the uh, <clears throat> time of preaching or presenting krishna consciousness so should one always speak the truth and shri prabhupad replied yes <clears throat> but a qualified devotee will be able to speak it in a palatable way <clears throat> in such a way that even an enemy will be attracted <clears throat> and then he said this is the art of speaking the truth and then he went on to say the same thing he said that it's not so much what you say but how you say that makes it important that that makes the difference and with experience we will learn to speak and present the truth in the proper manner so shri yes. prabhupad made several points in that particular exchange with this devotee number one that yes you must always speak the truth satyam but it should be priya because it is satyam it will be it must also be priya if it is satyam it is priya it will also be hitam <clears throat> mm. because that person will accept it and he, he then he said this is the art of speaking the truth So this is a very important phrase i feel for all of us the art of speaking the truth present krishna consciousness everywhere it's not just about speaking truth it's about how to speak the truth because prabhupad then mentioned there that how you say it is very very important yes so this is the most successful system prabhupad says yeah so so <coughs> in sense if we assume that we have authority because we speak the truth and then we may speak something which is so there are two things then there is something which is the truth is unpalatable and the second is truth is spoken unpalatably yes yes so the two is different things so as far as possible truth shouldn't be spoken unpalatably correct correct now so elsewhere also prabhupad said that you should speak truth in a way because you also asked me in terms of the response what are we looking at in terms of yeah um i think prabhupada said you should speak truth in such a way that the person responds positively yes so if the response is going to be highly negative then we have to consider where we went wrong 
and there are some audiences which will have just no interest <laughs> and no matter what you say uh, so if you're sticking to the truth no matter what you say they will they will not accept uh, yes. but then what can we do about that we we can't yes maharaj uh, That's we true. can't stop speaking the truth because of these situations yes but as far as possible our effort has to be to see that the person responds positively whilst still speaking the truth yes i here also we could talk about i mean speaking the truth uh we could also say which truth in the sense that scripture has many truths within them and we needn't speak do we necessarily have to speak that part of the scripture which is true but that is going to agitate the person so whether that is essential there is a conversation of shri prabhupad with uh, his disciples in hawaii and they asked prabhupad when we tell the scholars that say maharaj ugrasen had some astronomical number of bodyguards they start laughing at us and they say you know, how is it possible they all lived in dwarka where were their houses where were their washrooms and prabhupad gives a very surprisingly non confrontational reply he says among all the verses in the bhagavatam was that the only thing you found to speak to them <laughs> yes yes <clears throat> so the the part of the wisdom and the judgment comes not just in speaking the truth not just in speaking it palatably but also judging the content also judging which aspect of the truth you are going to be presenting to whom when and why you know so what aspect as you rightly said there's so much in the scripture and why don't we focus on the basic points the body and the soul you know transmigration of the soul the law of karma so there are many many things that you can speak of to a newcomer there's no need to get into areas that are unnecessarily controversial in that person's mind in your your mind is not controversial but that person may see it as being controversial mm. so why to unnecessarily go into that space prematurely you know yes so what you speak is also important when we say how you speak is important it doesn't mean that what you speak is not important even if it is the truth hmm so now judging which part of the truth to present and which part to not present you know yes maharaj so at one level we do any part of education means challenging others conceptions in fact we could say any good discussion or interaction involves a certain level of reincarnation now i had a particular conception and then i realized hey, that's that is that's not the exact thing and maybe that conception dies and then a more evolved conception comes up so challenging people's existing conceptions is essential but then you know we need to first establish our authority before we challenge the conception also not establish authority by simply lording it over them but so there has to be we could say some part of the speech which is which is pleasing which is reasonable which is spoken please speak pleasing like that establishes credibility and then some part which may challenge but if we directly challenge people's conceptions without having ex ex established our authority without having considered uh, their sensitivity or their their vulnerability we could say then we might that might backfire hmm <clears throat> yes prabhupad could get away with it <laughs> he could yes. say that i will i've been hearing conversations and many times prabhupad is directly confrontational uh, and challenging at the very first meeting the moment the professor sit down okay tell me <laughs> <laughs> you know uh 
what have you taught in the college, in the university? You, you, you teach, who am I? And yes. you taught this, he gets back. But, but they can see that he doesn't mean, you know, malice. There's no malice in his voice that he's, he's speaking it genuinely from conviction. And also that he has that stature. <laughs> you know, they've come in a mood of respect anyway. Mm. So they've, they've already come in a mood to listen. And plus he's an older man. So in between he would joke. See, I'm an elderly man. I can speak and get away with it, you know. So we have to consider all these factors. Yes, Maharaj. Um, so, going, going, so we talked about the truth. We could say which aspect of the truth to speak is one aspect. Then yeah. we need to be aware also of what is the effect, at least to some extent, of what is going to be the effect of what we speak. And then some agitation is essential, but some agitation, if it is not essential, then, then not speaking that those things are, that is, that is also the responsibility of the speaker. So now, if we, uh, there was, how much of the truth to speak on which occasion. So it could be that uh, well, I just give some people some food for thought so that they think and then they come back again. Hmm. That could be one approach. Other approach could be that that actually they may never come again. So let them hear. Let them get a like a full picture of the unvarnished truth and it will stay with them. So, <clears throat> so, so now it's like give one, one dose of vaccine. If they don't come, at least this will work for them. Or give them one thing, let them see the benefit and they may come again further for vaccination or whatever. So if you can take the medical metaphor. So any thoughts on this? How much of the truth to speak at one point? Prabhupada says that will come with experience. Okay. We have to learn the art of speaking the truth. <clears throat> that will come with experience and with practice, Srila Prabhupada says in his letters. So when we experience the different reactions that people give us, mm -hmm. when we preach in a certain way, we learn by experience. And look, that was not the nice way to do it. <laughs> I made a mistake there. I should be careful the next time. I shouldn't, I shouldn't preach in that way. So by experience, by practice, you know, by also looking at how experienced good preachers present Krishna consciousness, we can learn like that. So Maharaj, when we say experience, are we essentially mean, meaning observing the effect of what we do? Because what does experience mean in, that, in this particular context? Like when you yes. say doctor is experienced, okay, they give different medicines at different times and they observe what happens. So it's yes. mainly observing the effect. Yes. You saw that by speaking in this way, there was a vigorous reaction and vigorous negative reaction. Hmm. And that put off so many people and then the program stopped. It was a nice weekly program coming up and then people stopped coming, you know, and there was so much criticism going on and the whole program collapsed, right? And I learned, okay, so that's not a way to do things. I made a mistake there. Yes. Coming back to, you know, which part of the truth to present, etc. I'll tell you a bit of a funny thing that happened, you know, Many years ago, when I was about to go to a certain place uh, for preaching, it was the first time I went to that place uh, as a preacher. And uh, so I asked the local devotee who had organized the program, uh, so what would you like me to speak on? Uh, you know, so he said, you can speak on any topic, no problem. But please don't tell them to stop eating fish. <laughs> okay. Why? He said, because here people are, it's a coastal area. 
and people are so addicted to eating fish, they eat fish three times, four times a day. They can't live without fish. So if you tell them, stop eating fish, meat, this meat, at least, okay, they can maybe digest it, but fish, no way. Don't, don't tell them that, speak anything but that. Now, had I not got that little tip, I might have spoken about fish because I knew that people in those areas eat a lot of fish. So I might have said it, I don't know, but perhaps I would have. But after that, I was cautious. Hmm. So I didn't mention it at that time. And slowly, slowly, there were people have become devotees and they've given up fish and all that. <clears throat> so yes, it's like that. I, so eating, yeah, not eating fish is something we want to say, but in certain circumstances, we withhold. <laughs> we don't say it. Yes. So my, this, <clears throat> yeah, this brings us to one point that what, <clears throat> what comprises compromising the truth. Prabhupada often said, I never compromise. My spiritual master never compromised. So anytime a sensitivity is recommended, often some people will say that you are simply compromising with the truth. So in my understanding, compromising the truth would mean uh, when we are asked a specific question, and then we are wishy-washy. So I say, if somebody in that context had only asked you publicly, should you eat meat? Should we eat meat or not? Then maybe, so if an issue comes up on its own and then we, uh, we waffle on it, that could be compromise. But choosing not to speak a particular issue, that needn't be compromise. Any thoughts on this? See, Priyamcha Nandritam Bruyat. Don't speak an untruth because it's pleasing. Okay. So let's say, you know, telling people not to eat meat is a sensitive point in a particular area where we go. Hmm. Okay. So you don't start off in the very first lecture by bombarding them about the ill effects of meat eating and, <clears throat> you know, right, how, what the karmic effects are and so on. Okay. So you don't tell them all that. You give usual basics, lecture on the basics of Krishna consciousness. But then somebody asks you the question, as you said, should we eat meat? So obviously we can't speak an untruth just because that person likes, would like to hear it. So we definitely can't say, it's okay to eat meat, it's fine. We can't say that. So uh, what we could say is, uh, what, we, what I would say is that, look, it's not right, but we'll leave that discussion for another time. You just understand the process, what this Krishna consciousness is about. You start chanting and automatically everything will, will work out, everything will happen. That's interesting. Yeah. Now, wouldn't that, I mean, what, what would be the effect of this? Would it raise, like, why among the other audience, why is this question being avoided? Would it raise that question or it would just depends. avoid agitation? If there was a certain audience where I felt it was necessary to speak in detail, then I would have spoken about why meat eating is so harmful. Okay. Yes. So in some cases, say like, I gave you the example of that place where I went. He said, please don't speak about this. <laughs> mm. So if they had asked me the question, if somebody from the audience had asked me about fish. Okay. After this devotee had told me this before the lecture. Right. So I can't tell them, you know, just go on eating fish. It's fine. It's okay. I can't do that. At the same time, I'm not in a, it's not advisable from that devotee's point of view that I launch into a whole big uh, you know, analysis of how bad it is to eat fish. I may be very brief about it, briefly talk about it, okay, but emphasize that first understand what Krishna consciousness is. Okay. Yeah, and by that way you are, you're also, Stressing the point that 
Krishna consciousness is much bigger than just not doing this. Yes. So yes. don't get too fixated. Oh, I'll have to give this up. Understand yes. the whole. Yeah. Okay. Because there are many people who say, "Oh my God, they're going to ask me to give up me." Then I'm sorry, I can't come here. Okay. So lift them up to a certain level of understanding and faith, and then gradually these things will go on. See, we'll see in the early days when Prabhupada started uh, the movement. The first batch of devotees that got initiated, he told them about the four regulative principles only after they were initiated. Yes. Right. It's true. Yeah. So, Aharaj, this also brings us to one more point that when we talk about which truth to speak, there are there are central truths and there are we could say peripheral truths, or uh, and we could also say this from a perspective of the philosophy but we could also say this from the perspective of the audience that for the audience hearing this right now is more important and that is not so important so any guidelines about you know because quite often it may happen that a whole good talk gets uh, gets undone by because of an unrelated issue Unrelated question answer or just a pa unrelated pass passing comment which just uh, agitates people. So, what guidelines can we use to understand what is central and say what is peripheral? That which is an essential principle in Krishna consciousness is central. You know, Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. Now, you cannot say something else. Okay. Hmm. Uh, but there may be occasions when you won't stress it. You won't even mention it, perhaps. Let's say you go to a corporate program. Yeah. Where they want you to speak on, you know, something, some particular topic, and you try to bring in uh, some spiritual dimension to it, but you've been strictly told not to bring God in the picture. It's happened to me a couple of times. They tell you, please don't mention God or anything, you know. So you have a choice of either to go to that program or not go at all. Hmm. And if you go, then you have to do it on their terms. So if you find the terms to be not that objectionable, and that you're not really compromising that much. You're, you're presenting things in a way that uh, will be beneficial up to a point only. But then gradually you will get the opportunity go to, to go deeper into it. Then you might take up that opportunity. Hmm. So that means what is central and what is uh, peripheral can dramatically vary based on the context. That Krishna yes, as a Supreme is. Person is central, but yeah. there it is not central. Maybe there is, it's just give people an introduction to spirituality, make them at least explore life spiritual dimension. That's the central yes. purpose. Yes. Yeah, I remember I was talking with Hanumat Preshak Maharaj. He told me a very, he had been invited to speak on science and spirituality, something like that, spirituality and psychology by a professor. And then the HOD of that department came for the class and the dean of the college came for the class. And then the professor told him, you know, Swami, if you speak anything objectionable, it will kill me now. For all these people. <laughs> <laughs> so then after that, he said that uh, one person asked him, Swami, I see you are in a, mon you are in a monk's dress. So what is your religion? So then... Maharaj said that I spoke at that time that, you know, yeah, I may have my religion, you may have your religion, or you may have no religion. Now, right now, we are discussing about, uh, about uh, psychology Whatever. and consciousness. Whatever. Yeah, yes. so, you know, let's focus on this. If you want to know about my religion, we can talk about it afterwards. So, and he told me that the HOD, the principal, they were about nodding. That means the idea is that you don't use our podium to yeah. speak, to propagate your own ideology. Yes. So, so yes. on that podium, you speak what is expected or what yes. you have been asked to speak. 
Yes, yes. <laughs> so the, the sensitivity to the situation is is the hallmark of a good preacher. Oh. A good preacher must be able to distinguish, must be able to discriminate, you know, what to present, how to present, you know, to different audiences and circumstances, etc. Yes, Maharaj. So, mm. you know, I, I just remembered a joke, which I also say sometimes. There was this yeah. a king and an astrologer, you know, he had an astrologer. Hmm. So he, came, he, he came and said, I'm an astrologer. He said, okay, so tell me my future. So he said, oh, he looked at the palm. Are you an astrologer or a palm reader or something? So he looked at the palm of the king and said, oh, all your relatives are going to die before you and you will perform their last rites with your own hands. So the king was very uh, attached to his relatives and his family. So he became furious and he ordered that astrologer to be arrested. And then he called for another astrologer to come. That astrologer was a little more intelligent and he, <coughs> he had heard what had happened to the first fellow. So he I was asked the same question, tell me about my future. So when he read the palm or the chart or whatever it is, <clears throat> he saw the same thing that the first astrologer had said. <clears throat> but he presented it differently. Oh, my dear king, you will have a very long life. You will outlive your relatives. You will live longer than your relatives. So the king was very happy and he rewarded him. Yeah. So basically, he said the same thing that, you know, your relatives will die before you. But he presented it in a way that <coughs> appealed to the king. Yeah, and that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, Bhakti, Bhakti Tirt Maharaj has written a book, uh, one of the spiritual warriors' books. So he's talking about sense control, and the title of that chapter he had given was Harnessing Sexual Energy for World Peace. <laughs> <laughs> and then he talked about how sexual attraction has caused so many wars and things like that. So it's a very creative way of presenting. Yeah. I just going back to that joke, maybe <clears throat> I'll take this as one or two concluding points. But any thoughts on using humor in presenting? Because sometimes, as I said, humor can also backfire. What is seen as a joke by one person may not be seen as a joke by others. So any thoughts on the subject of using humor? Well, again, it depends on the nature of the person. It depends on the circumstances. I think a little bit of humor once in a while is fine. Uh, provided it is acceptable humor. Uh, so, but yeah. using too much of humor may distract attention from the real message. Yes. So, so some degree of humor is all right. I mean, that's yeah. It's fine. No, I was, just talking about, I was talking about humor here in sense of sensitivity, that maybe humor targeted at a particular group of people, say a particular region, a particular race, that might be appropriate in a particular, actually, it, it shouldn't be done any time, we could say. But especially in today's multicultural world, if humor is targeting a particular group of people, that could backfire severely. Yes, so naturally, that's why I said depends on which, whether it's acceptable humor or not. Yeah. The humor has to be such that it is acceptable. Uh, unfortunately, in this day and age, the kind of humor that we see is, is not at all something that is subtle or refined or or, uh, you know, even culture. Hmm. It's uh, what, what people these days are increasingly attracted to is a little raucous kind of humor, uh, you know, and uh, so that kind of humor, of course, is something we don't get into at all. Yeah. But that's what appeals to many people these days, but we don't get into it at all. But if it is 
you know, humor that is acceptable mm. and used uh, now and then just to, to kind of embellish your presentation <coughs> and keep the people uh, glued. And, and that humor has some connection to what you're saying. That's important. You, you, yes. you, speak, you give a lesson through the humor. Yes, that's true. It's not humor just for the sake of humor, just yeah. to make people, but you want to give a message through that. That's true, Maharaj. So one last question, and then maybe I'll try to summarize. Uh, when we talk about uh, sensitivity with respect to different audiences, so if some people are hypersensitive because of whatever reasons, you know, say somebody has come from a, a background of discrimination or whatever, and then they any statement just raises red flags for them. So is it advisable, This I had mentioned this earlier, that if a particular devotee finds a particular speaker's presentations very agitating, then, then is it advisable for that devotee? Okay, I'll still respect that speaker as a as a devotee, as a spiritual teacher. But but this doesn't work for me. So to what extent I think what it's okay. I think it's okay to some degree for the devotee to think like that because if the devotee still continue to attend those classes. Uh, he might start committing so many offenses. Oh, okay. and, and it might also disturb his own consciousness. He'll get agitated and so on. Then if that's the result that's going to happen, then might as well just avoid it. Mm. So we could say Anukulisa Sankalpa Pratikulyasya Varjanam. Yes. We have to see what is favorable for one's spiritual growth. Yes, yes. And uh, so it's not that we should be avoiding agitation completely, but we could also say that it, sh it shouldn't be like a constant agitation. So or it should not be like an overwhelming agitation. It should not be unnecessary. Because I mean, I, I don't think any speaker will, if they are, some speakers like to create like a sensation when they speak. And they may feel that no speaker will think that what I'm speaking is unnecessary agitation. The speaker's perspective, they may feel this is necessary for you to hear. Like say some speakers might say that it's necessary for the audience to hear that you shouldn't eat fish. But you know, maybe it's, that is not the time for them to hear that. Or rather I would say that some, sometimes speakers can be not deliberately speaking something that is unnecessary and creates agitation, but they are really careless. And casual. Okay, that's possible. Yeah, careless and casual, and and not really thinking deeply about what they're saying and what impact it could have. You know. Yes, Maharaj. So it's unnecessary to say that to 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 say that because it causes agitation. It's not even really so necessary to mm. to convey some important spiritual truth or something. Yes, Maharaj, and this is where. I think what you talk about experience counts a lot. Over the years, when I've been traveling, I recognize that uh, after I speak in a class, giving the audience time to speak and hear from them. The, this actually I learned from you. Every time I see after you give a class, it's like your class might be one, one and a half hours. Sometimes you sit for one, one and a half, two hours. This is a long queue of people wanting to meet you. And you give everybody your full attention and time. So I actually real, learned a lot that, you know, when we hear from our audience, we learn a lot about what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And then we can learn, we can, as you said, get that judgment, get that. So the, for a speaker, the wisdom doesn't come just by reading scripture. It also comes by interacting with the audience. Maybe you could yeah. speak some concluding words about the importance of this and then I'll summarize. You know, ultimately we are here for the audience, right? 
Hmm. So the very purpose of it, as I said, for satyam is hitam, no? <coughs> so if hitam is the objective, who is hitam? First of all, for the speaker himself, it's also because when I speak, I'm very clear, it's also for my benefit. And I find that when I speak Krishna consciousness or give a lecture, the person who benefits the most is me because I have to think about what I'm going to say. I have to meditate on that. And after the lecture is over, the, the subject continues for a while in the mind. You know, so the speaker benefits, at least I find that. Mm. So Hitam works for me. I'm, so I'm the first priority. Uh, or also you're speaking to an audience because if you didn't have the audience, you wouldn't be giving the lecture in the first place. Mm. So if it's for them that we are primarily speaking, then we should be concerned about uh, how they relate to the subject of the talk. You know, what, what are their concerns in relation to that, etc. Yes, Mm -hmm. So I'll try to summarize. You want to add anything else? Any points left no. out? Okay, I think thank you. So. so we discussed on the topic of sensitivity in presenting spiritual wisdom. We talked about the four four factors: the speaker, the subject, the context, and the audience. So I think we covered various aspects in it. So speaker has to be mature, and the speaker has to. You said wisdom and uh, nature so yeah. based on different people's nature they will speak in particular ways and with respect to wisdom is what can be developed and then we discussed about what all the developing wisdom can mean so broadly if we divide into these three factors that we have to cons consider we are speaking the truth but we are speaking the truth for a purpose of benefiting the audience and whether the benefit is happening or not, we need to consider. So we had that four quadrants where if uh, something is not truthful, not beneficial and not pleasing, then that's mm -hmm. undesirable. So yes. it's pleasing but not truthful. That's also undesirable. And the best is if it is truthful and pleasing. But in some cases, when that fourth quadrant doesn't work, then we may have to speak truthful even if it is not pleasing. And then most of our talk was what, what are the parameters for deciding when to speak this. So the first you said is first try to speak the truth palatably only. And you quoted the Subhashita. We also discussed Bhagavad 1740, 1716, 1715, Anudvega Karambakyam. Then within this parameter of when to speak, when the palatable, when it's not possible to speak the truth palatably, then we may have to speak the unpalatable truth. Then we have to see uh, whether the agitation that is caused, why is it caused? Is it because of some unwanted, say, use of words, like say cult or something like that? Then better avoid that. Or is it a necessary agitation because that's what is required for people to, to revise their conceptions? To grow in their understanding, then then agitation also has to be such that people can take it. Like we talked about the comfort zone, stretch zone, and panic zone. So we want to stretch people's conceptions, but not so much that they feel overwhelmed. And that would mean that the speaker has to consider. So one criteria for un, uh, understanding hitha, when is the person benefited? It is not just by they hearing the truth, but also by they wanting to hear the truth more. They wanting to take up spirituality more. And if they go away, then that is undesirable. So then we talk about in this, we cannot assume that because we are speaking the truth, people will accept it because we may have to establish our authority. And that means the way we conduct ourselves, the way we speak, the cultured way, which will, the logical way that will establish the authority. And then also which truth we speak. So truth has many aspects and that which is most relevant or beneficial for the audience, we speak that. And if something is like you, the example of, of fish, that if something is uh, too, going to be too agitating or impractical, 
for them then not speaking it is not a compromise so so speaking choosing which speak truth to speak is not compromise but uh, re refusing to speak the truth itself when it is asked for or speaking an untruth that is a compromise and then we talk about how devotees will learn by experience and experience essentially means observing the effect of what we speak and that means we interact with the audience and we you know that we are speaking for the audience so what is the effect we need to we can hear from them to learn and humor also if we use it is appropriate and that means not targeted toward a particular group and used in moderation and then you also mentioned about shri prabhupad that although he because of his age and spiritual maturity spiritual stature spoke certain things and he was he could be directly confrontational and uh, people would not sense any malice in him but for us it may not apply and also in today's digital age we might speak one thing in one context but people might just uh, cut it out and hear it in another context mm -hmm. so it is important so you said that sensitivity is an essential characteristic of a of a speech of a speaker of Christian, of spiritual wisdom smaj yes thank you and ultimately what is the goal we want to see that the person moves closer towards krishna yes yes that's the ultimate purpose that is our understanding of hitam yes maraj so if we drive the person away from krishna then what's the point yes maraj right yes thank you this was a quite a comprehensive discussion and very illuminating for me personally also many dimensions yeah thank you very much for your time thank and thank you thank you, thank you. Hare, krishna. Hare, krishna. hare krishna hare krishna hare krishna hare krishna hare krishna